How many know that God has blessed you with messy people? Come on, come on. How many know that you are the mess that God's blessed somebody else with? Come on, come on. Yeah, life is super messy and God is good, right? If you grew up in any kind of church context for any length of time, you probably heard this phrase before, God is good and all the time. I like to change it a little bit if we could. God is good all the time. So God is good and all the time people are messy. I'm, I'm going to promise you that. Like, people are difficult. People are hard. It would be so much easier to pastor a church if there weren't people in it. Right? Some of you guys, like, I just think you're about to make it. You're just about to get there. And then it like, man, you all messy. Right? You know, and that's the deal, right? And, and the people that God's entrusted to you are messy. Your family is messy. Where you work is messy. Your neighborhood is messy. Your community is messy. And, and so in this next few weeks together, we're going to be looking at how do we become the blessing God's called us to be in the messiness of the people he's called us to. How do we learn how to you know, navigate our own emotions and our own feelings in such a way that we can actually continue to be that blessing that he's called us to be. Last week, Pastor Travis spoke about we are blessed by God to be a blessing. Didn't he do a great job last week? Give it up for Pastor Travis. Um, But in the middle of the mess of this life, in the middle of the chaos and the drama and the trauma of it all, how do you make sure that you're bringing your best and how do you get the most out of the people that God's entrusted to you and sort of very practical, very tactical way of looking at it. Now, some of you that you're here, um, you're, you know, experiencing God for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time. You're trying to find out more about this Jesus. Some of you are doubters. Some of you are skeptics. Some of you are not sure what you believe. And here's my promise for you over the next four weeks, regardless of what you believe or think about Jesus, the truth of his word can make your life better and make you better at life if you'll allow it to, okay? There's some really great information that's very practical, that's got handles that we can hold on to, and I'm hoping that I'm going to inspire you to be a better parent, a better leader, a better friend, a better, you know, like just in general, a better employee and better blo- and better boss based off of what the word of God says about us and how we ought to be behaving in these messy times that we're in. Um, I wanted to sort of set you guys up with this idea this morning. We're going to talk about criticism and the difference between, obviously, praise and criticism. And then we're going to zero in. Um, If you're taking notes, you're going to want to be paying attention right now. We're going to zero in on the reality of the difference between complaints and critique. Both of them can be considered criticism, but critique is meant to elevate you and help you to become better and complaints is just something that we're really addicted to doing aren't we right and how we can become better at bringing positive specific criticism into the lives of people that God's entrusted to us to help them become the men and women God he's called us to be instead of just complaining um, and it not actually getting us anywhere Uh, the reason I thought that this was so important for us to do today and and I don't know if you guys all know this or not but I work really hard Um, I put the majority of my effort and my energy into studying and preparing the sermons. I have a really great team um, of volunteers and staff members here at Hope City Church, from our board of directors to our ministry team to our team members that do a lot of the work of the ministry. And so your pastor gets to really focus on studying and preparing to bring the message um, and then I also gives me the freedom to travel. I just got back from Turkey. I was on a vision slash mission trip to Turkey. For those of you who aren't on social media, you missed out greatly because I was like trying to post all my stuff as soon as I got to be there and see it. It was very renewing for me and it was very um, like it was just like a biblical education, a whole nother layer to biblical education that I didn't have with regards to Asia Minor, uh, where Paul spent a lot of his time, where um, the with a, John the Beloved, uh, the, the author of the book of Revelation, and the churches that he was writing to when he wrote the book of Revelation. Very amazing time. And then also getting to spend some time in some of the, um, with some of our missionaries and our strategic partners that are there in Turkey working with the Syrian refugee crisis. So 
But um, if you're not familiar and you're, you know, maybe you're one of those people that just doesn't watch the news, I mean, droves and droves of people are pouring out of Syria since 2011, to be honest with you, where the Syrian uh, civil war sort of popped off in 2014. It got super crazy, and they've been coming in in droves. Um, and Turkey was told by the European Union, if you can house all of these people, we'll send money and take care of you, right? We'll fund it if you, if you house them. And then, of course, that's not worked out so much. And then right now, at a point of desperation, the American church has come alongside of the Turkish government and said, hey, we're going to do something about this crisis and we're going to support you. So it's a beautiful opportunity for us to do ministry and serve the people of Turkey in a powerful way. Now, before I was going on this trip, everybody seemed to have an opinion about it. You ever notice that? Everybody always has an opinion about your life. Anybody ever noticed that before? Um, when I worked construction, there was a saying, don't repeat it if you know what I'm getting at. They would say, opinions are like, yeah. I, at church, I say it like this, opinions are like elbows. It's much better, right? Normally, I'd say opinions are like, we'll say elbows, and everybody has one and it stinks, right? So you there in case you never work construction? Yes? Okay. Opinions are like elbows. Everybody has a couple, but they're not good for much, right? Um, that's how we say it at church because Jesus has redeemed our language. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Everybody seems to have an opinion, and some people came to me with lots of praise. Pastor, we're so excited about your trip to Turkey, and you're such a man of God, and we can't believe you're doing it. Woo! Right? And that was awesome, and I felt really good. Thank you very much. And then other people were like, are you sure this is a good time for you to go? to that region of the world. You could die. Yeah, I could die. I could also die in our neighborhood. Like I shop at Walmart on 2nd Street. <laughs> Just saying, right? right? People are like, you could get the coronavirus anywhere, right? Um, and then, you know, like that sort of thing. Other people are like, are you sure this is a good time for our church? Yeah, I think it's a really bad time for our church to see their pastor bringing the mission and hope of Jesus to the world one person at a time, not just in, you know, Jerusalem, but Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah, it's really a bad idea, right? Right? What about what's been happening with your family lately? Do you think it's a good time for you to be away from your family? You guys have had a lot of drama and trauma lately. They need you. Yes, that's true. They do need me. Um, they need me to walk in the fullness of God's plans and purposes for my life as their dad, as their pastor, as the leader of Hope City Church. And, and so while praise and criticism, right? Um, can come from, sometimes it comes from a good place and sometimes it comes from a bad place. Even praise sometimes doesn't come from a healthy place. Listen to me. Sometimes people praise you because they want to manipulate you, right? Sometimes people criticize you because they're broken and they don't know how to articulate their feelings except for to make you try to feel the brokenness that they feel, right? And so today in the first half of this message, I want us to deal with our stuff so that we can be better at giving praise and criticism. We're going to focus in on critique today. I know that you might have a hard time sort of bifurcating the word critique from criticism. So I want you to do it like this. One, critique is good. Complaint is bad. Both of them can be housed under the word criticism. Right? Critique is meant to make you better. Complaints just weighs you down. So we're going to be the kind of people and we're going to be a culture as a church where we're open to critique because it makes us better, sharper, faster, stronger, but we're not going to be the kind of people that just complain, right? Like when we get to the new building, the church chairs there are very similar to the church chairs here, right? And somebody's going to be like, these aren't very comfortable. I miss our old chairs, right? That's complaint, right? Critique would be, what if we got new chairs and I paid for them? <laughs> See what I'm saying? I'm just playing. They're really actually awesome chairs. I think they're actually a little bit better than these chairs, to be honest with you. But, like, do you see what I'm saying? There's always something to complain about, right? And then there's always something to praise somebody about. While I appreciate the encouragement, right, sometimes people come up to me after service and they go, that was a great sermon, Pastor. And I'm like, really? What was great about it? Mm, right? And so if you're not careful, the people that are singing your praises, you could start to believe the hype and think you're better than you are. 
right? And if you're not careful, the people that are just complaining about you could drag you down into the mud and the muck. And everybody has an opinion. The beautiful thing about us in the world that we live in in 2020 in the United States of America, in Southern California, in San Diego, is we have a lot of freedom to do what we need to do in the way that we need to do it and express our opinions and our feelings. And, and we, we don't feel the oppression that the ancient church felt. One of the things that was shocking for me and when I was on my trip this week was how the New Testament sort of proliferated out of the area of Turkey. The church at Ephesus was sort of one of the major hubs in which the church became, you know, like expanded across the globe there through to Europe from Jerusalem to Asia Minor to Europe and then to the world. And yet it didn't take that long for Christianity to be completely swallowed up by the darkness of that region. And it became almost where it was illegal and difficult to be a Christ follower in that region. In fact, I shot a little video that I wanted to show you guys really briefly. And, and I, just to be a bit of an encouragement to you, um, what God is doing in and through you as a church. But check this out. That was one of the spaces and places that I was sitting there and I was thinking about it. I was a little bit blown away by us because I was, per I was sitting at a coffee shop in downtown Ankara and I had my phone out and I was looking at my message for this weekend and as I was preparing for it and thinking about the messy people that we have to deal with and the critique and the comments that people have for us and how we listen from the peanut gallery and how, you know, sometimes we can feel oppressed by the people who don't agree with us with how we're living our lives or how we're raising our kids or why we do the things that we do. And then I was just shocked as I looked down at the table and I moved my coffee cup that somebody at that table had carved that same wagon wheel logo into the table. In a country where 80 million people live and only 7,000 people are registered as Christ followers. Now, maybe there's more than that, but in Turkey, you have to like tell the government what your faith is so that when your kids go to school, they either go to the Muslim class for their like what we would call catechism in, in Catholic world. They either go to Muslim catechism, it's not called that, but you get it, right? Or not. And so if you don't register your family, then they're gonna be, your kids are gonna grow up in the Muslim faith regardless because they're gonna go through that catechism. There's only 7,000. There's more registered Christians in North Korea. There's more registered Christians in Iran. This is a really unreached people group. So much so that 2,000 years in the future, they're still carving secret symbols to say, hey, Christians meet at this coffee shop and talk about Jesus at this very table. And so if you see us here there's a good chance this is a safe place for you to find out about love and grace and mercy. This is a place where the good news can be a reality. The reason that I think this is so important, and like I said, because I'm, I've been given the gift of such an amazing team, I get to spend all kinds of time writing my sermons. In fact, on Thursdays, that's pretty much all I do is write, and it gives me the ability to get super far ahead. So long before I even had the opportunity to go on this trip to Turkey, the sermon I was going to preach today was written. And then I get there and I go, oh, wow, our mess is so messy. <coughs> Come on. And so how we deal with our mess affects whether or not other people can get through their mess to get to the good news, to get to God's grace and his understanding. And so I want to take us on a quick journey this morning. If you have your Bibles and you have your notepads, um, we're going to start with this verse from Ecclesiastes 7. Verse 5, it's better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool, right? Now, I'm going to throw myself under the bus here so you can understand what this phrase means. Um, how many of you know your pastor is super wise? Everybody said amen, but uh, he's equal part foolish, right? I'm a great mix of hood and holy all together, yeah? So I'm on this trip with a bunch of people. Um, when I get tired... Um, you know, I get squirrely. Is that a good way to say it? I get squirrely. Um, I was on a couple of really long flights for this trip. We flew in country. It took about 12 hours to get there. And then while we were there, we made a bunch of different flights. And so because I'm tired, and then of course I'm with a bunch of like senior pastors who are all like super buttoned up, right? Older ladies and gentlemen who are very, um, I don't know, 
uh, way more conservative than your pastor. Um, I just thought it was my job to bring a little levity to everything that was happening, right? So um, I convinced a group of them that if I text them um, this particular text message, they had to make a weird sound. They got to choose their sound, <coughs> but they had to make a weird sound. So some of them, right before they set their phones down on the, on the belt and went through the metal detector, of course I would text them, <laughs> right? And so some of them, as they went through the metal detector, were like, oh, yeah, right? And other ones were like, meh, right, you know? And they were such great sports. I was like, look, man, you got to do this. This is going to make our trip so much fun. And I was so amazed by how easy it was for me to convince them to act super foolish. These are godly men and women, leaders, right? And it was like, I mean, honestly, I, I could have manipulated them so quickly, so easily to do all kinds of things, to be ridiculous, and they felt free and safe to do it because their congregations weren't there, and it was just so much fun for me because, well, I am wise, but I'm also foolish, right? And, and I'm throwing myself under the bus here, but all, it had, all I had to do was allude to the fact that all the cool kids were doing it. I didn't use those phrases, Right, But just a little bit of peer pressure, just a couple of us that did it, and a couple of us got a little attention for being a little bit silly, and they all wanted to be silly with us. Right? Sometimes the praise of someone is just enough for you to believe that what you're doing is going to connect you and make a meaningful relationship, and it's going to be enough to see you to the next season. Make sure the person that's praising you is actually giving you encouragement that is godly encouragement, and not just some craziness, right, to just be crazy for crazy's sake. Now, I want you to think about that in your family. I want you to think about in your in your work. I want you to think about in your community. Sometimes people are pumping you up because they're wanting to manipulate you. They want to, you to believe that they are on your side and they have your back so that you can be their shield while they do their undermined things, okay? So be careful who you're receiving praise from and how deep you're letting that praise go into you. Does that person have what's best in mind for you? Do they love you? Do they care for you? Or are they just trying to get a cheap laugh at your expense? Because that's all, honestly, that's all I was trying to do. Like, this will be fun. I'm tired. We've been on a plane for too long. What if you, when you were getting patted down, which I got patted down at every checkpoint, <laughs> right? And you'd be surprised how weird people are when you bring kilos of coffee wrapped in newsprints back from a foreign country. And they're like, it's just coffee. They don't believe you, right? <laughs> weird, right? Yeah. And so I decided to make the, the moment light by being a little bit ridiculous, and they all wanted to join in. How many places and spaces in your life are you letting the praises of people lead you to do things that you wouldn't normally do because it makes you feel included? It makes you feel like you're a part of something. It gives you a sense of purpose and meaning. But did you slow down long enough? Students, listen to me. Did you slow down long enough to ask yourself, was it worth it? The same thing is with critique, right? When someone is criticizing you, when someone's complaining to you, when someone is trying to give you information that will help you get better, you have to ask yourself, where is this coming from? Can I trust this information? Is this beneficial to me? Is it going to make me better, faster, stronger? Or is this person just complaining about me again? Praise often reveals the things that we value most. Now, the reason that this is so important is I want you to think about the way you talk to your children, your spouse, your coworkers, right? Your employees, your team, your, like, your, your, uh, the kids that you, that you teach, the people that you have been entrusted to. You can tell somebody about your core values until you're blue in the face. But once you start praising someone for living out the things you value, you'd be surprised how quickly everybody starts valuing it. Let me give it to you like this. If you're a parent and you have multiple kids, if you reward one of the children for doing what they were supposed to do without being told to do it, the other kids are going to want to get that reward as well. 
And the same is true as a boss. If you're a boss and one of your core values is, is that we work until the work is done, and then at one of the next time you have a staff meeting, you give a $5 Starbucks card to one of your staff members that worked until the work is done, and you praise them for what you value, what's going to happen the next time? You'd be surprised what Starbucks cards can do for your employees. You'd be surprised what an ice cream cone can do for your children, right? Some people call that bribery. I call it positive reinforcements, right? I would have never got Aaron potty trained without positive reinforcement, right? It's bribery, right? What I'm saying by that is, is when you, when you connect it with praise, what gets rewarded gets repeated. Listen to me again. What gets rewarded gets repeated. And so when you thank someone, when you praise somebody for a job well done, when you appreciate them with words of affirmation and you do it in public, then other people will behave in that way because what gets rewarded gets repeated. This is important for you as leaders to understand this. Number two, criticism often reveals your deepest insecurities. There's a reason that you have one child in your family that you're a little bit harder on than everyone else in your family. Because they remind you of you. Do you hear me? Because you're afraid that they're going to turn out like you. And so because you don't want that to happen, you're a little bit tougher on them. Let me tell you something. Unfortunately for your child, that's not their burden to carry. So stop putting that weight on them. Coworkers, friends, neighbors, same thing, right? Did you ever notice that you're harder on somebody? than you are on yourself. Here's a, the way I see it all the time too. Um, whenever I decide that I need to lose a little bit of weight, because I lose weight and then it finds me. Anybody else have that issue? Yes. I lose it, then it finds me. I lose it, then it finds me. A couple of years ago, I lost almost 80 pounds. About 20 of it has found me over time. I try to stay away from it, but it, like, it finds me, man. And it finds me with donuts and lasagna. <laughs> finds me. But when I, when I get like where I'm like, okay, I'm going to get serious again. I'm going to lose a few more pounds and 10, 15, 20, whatever. Everybody comes out of the word work with an opinion on how I should lose it, right? And most of those people are fatter than me. You know what you need to do? Not listen to you, fatty. Right? And they have opinions about it. Why? Well, because... They wish they could look in the mirror and say it to themselves, but they can't, and they aren't, they aren't able to hear it. So if they say it to you, maybe they could hear it. Sometimes people's complaint or criticism is, has very little to do with you. Their advice, because that's what they think it is, right? Advice has very little to do with you and everything to do with them, right? A lot of people have come up to me, and I love you to death if you're here. This isn't a dig. This isn't a slam. This is just reality, right? A lot of people have come up to me and have told me um, how I should be dealing with the loss of my grandson, Solomon, right? And well-meaning, advice-giving people, right? And it's like, and then they'll fill in the blank about somebody that they've lost or some loss that they've experienced. And, and I'm like, thank you so much for that. Some people, it's, I'm able to just let them express. We'll talk about this in a minute, right? Express what they need to express so they can hear those words said out loud for themselves. But it's not really advice for me. Do you hear what I'm saying? And there's like, you know what you need to do, and then they're kind of harsh about it. You need to, because it's, that's what has to happen. And the reason they're saying that is because they didn't do it when they experienced the loss that they experienced. And so they're wanting to save me from feeling the pain that they're feeling. But what they're really saying is, I, I should have listened to this advice, and I didn't, and I'm still dealing with it. Right? So praise and critique often show what we value and what we're most insecure about. And so when you think about those sorts of things, you have to take them in the context of how you're processing and what you're going through and what's happening in your life. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, let's hold them up high. If you've got your notebooks and you're ready to learn from God's word, let's do it together right now. Matthew chapter 7. This is one of those passages that people like to take out of context, especially the first couple verses. If you've ever watched any sort of daytime courtroom television reality TV, this this is a verse that's often popped off and quoted to the judge when the judge is about to make a judgment, right? They say, only God can judge me, judge, right? And you're like, well, actually, I'm the judge, and I'm about to judge you, right? <coughs> it's often misquoted. It says, do not judge, or 
you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I like to believe that um, at the end of time when I stand before God and, and that great white throne judgment is happening, the way I treat people and the way I've, I've, the way I've, I've, I've judged their decisions and their behavior, that God will use the same um, I, I hope his grace will be more sufficient than this, but what scripture is saying right there is that, that you're going to be held accountable for how harsh you were with other people, and so pay attention to that. Now, I, I don't think and believe as your pastor and as the um, minor theologian that I have become, um, especially now that I've traveled to Turkey you know, right, and, and seen where the early church walked, right? Um, I'm really like a changed man now, right? So I don't think that so much that that's about the end of time judgment, but it's, it's more about the way you judge people now on earth, the people will judge you in the same way. So like if you're always harsh with people, people are going to be what? Harsh with you. And so like don't judge or you too will be judged in the same way that you judge others, right? You will be judged. The measure that you use, it will be measured to you. What you give, you're going to get. What you dish out, you're going to have to take back. Be careful what you say. It's going to come back to you. In this life, what we sow, we will reap. What we plant, we will harvest. Verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Why are you saying, oh, do you have a a little bit of dust in your eye? Let me help you with that. Meanwhile, you have a log jammed into your retina, right? You're always wanting to help someone else with their minor insufficiencies and difficulties, and you're ready to tell them how they can make their life better when your life is falling apart. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when the whole time there's a plank in your own? You hypocrite, Jesus says. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. I was reminded of this when I was on the plane, and they said, if cabin depressurization happens, oxygen masks will fall. Please place your oxygen mask on yourself before you try to help someone else with theirs. And here's why. You can't help someone that's weaker than you if you're not breathing yourself, right? You can't help someone clear out their crap if you don't clear out yours first. And so before you give wisdom to someone else that may sound like judgment, the way to make sure wisdom sounds like wisdom or the good news stays the good news is for you to be able to live it out yourself. No one wants to take diet advice from someone that's fatter than them. Does it make sense now? Right? So he's saying, right, you got to deal with your stuff before you can help someone else deal with theirs. And then he goes on to talk about when you give your opinion, when you give your thoughts, when you give your criticism, your complaint, your critique, your praise, be careful how you give it. He says, don't give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their feet and they may turn on you and tear you to pieces. Just because I have something to say doesn't mean it brings value to the conversation. And just because I have an opinion doesn't mean it's good or it's right. They're like elbows, right? Everybody has one or two, right? And they normally aren't that helpful, right? I would like to say to my team all the time when we're in staff meeting and I have an idea, I said, hey, this is an idea. It might even be a terrible idea. Just because I'm the boss doesn't mean that my ideas are awesome. I'm, I'm a big dummy sometimes, and I come up with really stupid ideas. And so you have to tell me, yeah, that's a bad idea, all right? And so, so just because I have something inside of me that I want to say doesn't mean it's helpful or beneficial. Um, you should probably think about that before you post on social media next. Just, be can, just because I can doesn't mean I should. Or I, my favorite way to say it to us as Americans is just because it's within my rights doesn't make it right. Come on. And so um, we're going to shift gears right now, and we're going to talk about how can I help the people that God's entrusted to me, um, and how do I not let them sort of suck the life out of me, because messy people can if you're not careful. And we'll talk about that more next week. We're going to talk about time vampires next week, people in your life that just really suck. Yeah. 
so don't miss it. It'll be our first message in our new building. <laughs> Bring your friends, especially the ones that suck. Um, don't invite them that way, though. Hey, pastor said I should bring from all my sucky friends. You want to come to church with me? Because you're the worst. Uh, there's right and wrong responses to receiving praise and criticism, complaints, right? Um, and typically what we do is we fight or flight. Um, we either get really uncomfortable and we want to run away or we want to fight with the person who's giving us feedback. Um, this happens a lot in marriages. This happens a lot with teenagers and parents. This happens a lot with bosses or coworkers. Someone's just trying to point out like, hey, we said we were going to do this instead of that. And then all of a sudden it turns into a big fight. Right? It doesn't have to always be a fight. Or the opposite happens. We're just a big avoiders. We avoid, we avoid, we avoid. Here's the thing. When you avoid a problem, when you come back, the problem's still going to be there. Yeah, you got you to deal with it, but you got to deal with it right. And you got to deal with it in terms that you're ready to deal with it. And so sometimes when someone is giving you criticism, you're not ready to deal with it. And so you run away. I get that. Um, sometimes males and females, we genetically and historically are wired differently and were raised in American culture to process information differently. Um, if you were raised in a traditional sort of American dynamic, um, we are taught boys aren't supposed to fight with girls. That's just a pretty like standardized concept. And so sometimes ladies, when you're with your husbands and or your boyfriends and you guys start to get into a heated information, a heated exchange of information and he starts to remove himself from the situation, it's not because he doesn't love you or doesn't believe in you or doesn't believe in this relationship. He was just taught at a very young age, don't fight with girls. And so all he's trying to do is honor the core values that were put deep inside of him, right? And so he's trying to get away from it. It's not that he doesn't care, not that he doesn't love. He just doesn't have the tools of language necessarily that you do. Do you ever notice that? Right? That ladies, you just have the ability to say it and you have perfect recall, especially when it comes to things that we've said. You don't seem to remember what you said, but you always remember verbatim. It's like you have a notebook and you're like, well, actually on March 14th, 2018 you said and you're like how do you remember that right and we we aren't ready for that we can't deal with it so we run away but here's the deal those are not necessarily the right responses all the time even with praise sometimes people praise us and we don't know how to deal with that because we've never had that kind of healthy dynamic where someone rewarded us for a job well done and so we get really awkward and uncomfortable and we just like Ugh, right yeah. My favorite in church circles is people are like, what a great sermon, or what a great worship set, or you did such a good job, and they're like, it was all Jesus, right? Well, it wasn't that good, you know? Like, um, if Jesus did it, it would have been way better than that. You know, we don't know how to do it, and so we, like, avoid from it, we run away from it, we like, no, 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 it was everybody else. It's okay to just say thank you when someone tells you that you did a good job. Everybody practice it, say thank you. You did such a good job at that. Yeah. Right. See, there we go. She can be taught, folks. She can be taught. Right? The right responses. I'm going to give you three of them if you're taking notes, how to deal with someone who's giving you criticism. Um, and we're, we're looking at this from the vantage point of more criticism that's just negative. Um, and so how to deal with that, not necessarily critique. We'll talk a little bit more about critique in a minute. But right responses. Listen, if their motive is to help you and not hurt you, but they're just not really good at giving feedback, then let them practice on you, right? Sometimes people aren't good at giving feedback and words fail us. Um, or if that person has information that can actually help you, um, you should listen to what they have to say. Now, if that's, the, um, if that's the, the idea, then the opposite of that would be true as well, right? You, you don't necessarily have to listen if they're there to hurt you. And you obviously don't have to listen if they don't have anything to offer you. But you need to slow down long enough. And even if they spew it out, go home 
and maybe digest it and then decide if you want to further that conversation with that person, if they can help you or if they have something to offer to you. The reason um, I think this is so important, Proverbs says it like this, the book of wisdom, that if you listen to constructive criticism, that's what I call critique, right? If you listen to constructive criticism, not complaints, constructive criticism, critique makes you better, Um, you'll be at home among the wise. But if you reject criticism or critique, you'll only harm yourself, right? I would love for you to be the type of leaders who build a culture of critique, that you welcome people to speak into your life about how to make it better. How do I become a better leader? I would love for you to say things like this. And I'm not asking you to do something I wouldn't do. You can ask anyone that's on my team one of the last things I say to them. Lisa, what's one of the last things I say to you in every meeting that we have together? Anything I'm doing to get in your way, let me know. In other words, I'm inviting her to give me critique or feedback about how my leadership is causing her pain? Is there something I'm doing that I'm not aware of that's making it uncomfortable for you to do your job? When was the last time you invited one of your teenagers in your life to give you feedback? One of your employees to give you feedback. Kids, chill, 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 right? Like, yeah, mom, you better listen to the word of God, right? Yeah, I love it. They're like, those heads, man, they spun around. That's not even your mom. Like, (laughs) yeah, Lisa. (laughs) Oh, so good, right? There's something about it when, when you build a culture where it's okay for people to have honest interactions and conversations with each other and that there's no fear of retaliation and they can say courageous things to you that you might not want to hear that you'd be surprised that even though the people that on the org chart are beneath you and just on the org chart because nobody's beneath you by the way but on the org chart are beneath you that they could actually teach you something they could actually bring life change to you and it might be refreshing and make you a better leader a better friend a better parent number two if you're taking notes um, sometimes when people have an opinion Um, it's appropriate for you to answer back, especially if they're missing information, right? Sometimes people are way missing information, right? Um, I think we've coined the phrase in modern day culture in, I think, 2018, 19 and beyond, we say fake news, right? When we believe someone's missing information or we want them to believe that they're missing information, um, maybe we're wanting to misdirect them and they have all the information. We say fake news anyway, right? Um, so the, the point of it is this. Sometimes people are missing information. Somebody recently I ran into, and um, for the sake of their own spiritual development, I'll just leave them nameless. They said, Eric, I can't believe that you sold your building and that you're moving your congregation from that corner. What are you going to do with all that money? I was like, what? Oh, I bought a yacht. (laughs) A, I didn't sell the building. The people that own the building have sold the building, and now we're going to be moving. And we're we're just trusting God to be faithful, even though man got in the way of what we believe God's plans were initially. And we know that all things, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for those who are called by the name of Jesus according to its purpose, Jesus' name, right? We know that. So all things work together. So even though man got in the way and messed it all up, we're just going to follow him. And so I had to have a conversation with that person and say, hey, so here's what actually happened and here's what's going on because you're missing information. If you think that I sold the building and somehow I'm going to profit from it and we're just going to move somewhere cheaper so that I can get a new car, wow, I would never do that, right? That's not who I am. That's not how this works, right? Sometimes people have missing information. They don't understand. They don't understand what that's like. So when you come to work with like a brand new watch, everybody's like, oh, it must be nice. You got a raise. You're like, actually, my grandfather died and left me this, right? right? Now, you don't have to be a jerk about it. <laughs> but sometimes people have missing information and you have to fill them in, 
right? I don't understand how you can afford that and I can't. We have the same job. Well, actually, my, my spouse, my wife, has this really great job. She makes more money than me. How cool is that? So I'm like a kept man, right? I wish that was my story. I'm just trying to speak it into existence, right? Sometimes you can give someone an answer when they come at you with negative complaints because that you, you perceive that maybe they're prepared or ready to hear from you a different side of the story. When I was... In Turkey this last week, our guide, who, um, she's Muslim, but she's not like, uh, she was born into the Muslim faith. Um, I don't know how to describe it. So she's, she's a uh, dervish Muslim, which is like in California, somebody who says, um, I believe in God, but I don't go to church. I'm just real spiritual. Does that give you a sense of it, right? So she's not, she doesn't like go to mosque. She doesn't have an imam, which is like a pastor in the Muslim faith. She doesn't have that, but but like, so she was brought up Muslim. Her biggest thing is um, love. That's what um, dervish Muslims believe, that love is the center of the universe. And if you can express love to others, love will come back to you. And the way that you know God is happy with you is how many people love you. Because if you love well, people will love you. Um, It's very, I mean, it's a hop, skip, and a jump from the truth, Right? Just real close, super close. And so we spent a lot of time together, and her and I talked. And there were some moments where she's brilliant, by the way. Um, Her name is DeLake. Um, Like, my car fell in DeLake, right? Um, And super brilliant. That's her joke, not mine, right? Um, Super brilliant, knows the Bible. I was challenged that this, um, this Muslim woman who was, I mean, nominal, I guess is the right word, nominal Muslim woman, know, knew the Bible better than your pastor. I was like, dang, I stepped my game up, right? And she was like quoting chapter and verse about the places and spaces that we were. And I get it, that's her job. That, that's why she's good at it. But, um, you know, so we're there. And, and I asked her this question. <clears throat> she hasn't done a lot of tours with uh, Protestant Christians, mostly Catholic Christians. And that portion of the world Catholicism um, was probably the dominant um, Christian force in the early years because the Roman Catholic Church, um, Emperor Constantine, made Roman Catholicism normalized. And so then in Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul, which is Turkey, you know, blah, 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 blah. I can't take you all on the tour today. We don't have time. All right. Um, And so most of the people that come there on a pilgrimage to see the spaces and places are often Catholic. And as you know, in Catholic faith, Mother Mary is a big deal um, to the point where she's almost equal with Jesus. And you know that from our understanding of scripture, while Mary's awesome and she's done some really great things by being the carrier of Jesus into the world, she's Mary, she's not God, and we don't pray to Mary because she is not Jesus, um, that sort of stuff, okay? Um, And so... You know, so she was talking about Mother Mary, Mother Mary, Mother Mary, and she asked me, uh, we became kind of tight friends pretty quick, which was weird to have me and this pseudo-traditional Muslim woman become very close friends very quickly. She says, how come everybody sort of rolls their eyes when I say Mother Mary? And go, oh, because we're not Catholic. And she's like, I don't understand. Don't you guys think Mary's important? I'm like, yeah, for sure Mary's important. And then I said, but do you never notice that everywhere we're here, there's like these little temples to goddesses everywhere? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she named some of them and talked about some of them. I go, yeah, yeah. Do you think that maybe the reason that the ancient church elevated Mary in such a way was because they needed a replacement for the goddesses so that the people would jump over and follow Jesus. And so they were just attempting to make everybody understand and connect meaningfully. And she was like, oh my gosh, I never thought about it like that before. And like blew her mind, right? And here's the deal, right? In that moment, she was open to an answer to how come you guys don't care about Mary? Well, here's why, and here's the deal, and it shifted. Later that night, we all went out for coffee together. It was late in the evening, and she says, Eric, help me out with something. And I'm, again, I'm with all these other really like big deal pastors with their button ups and hoo, 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 right? And she wants to talk to the weird looking dude. <laughs> I understand Jesus. I understand the Father. Tell me about the Holy Spirit. And I begin to share with her about the Holy Spirit lives in you, flows through you. And she says, what you believe sounds a lot like what I believe, except for yours is connected to Jesus and mine's connected to no one. And I said, exactly. And she says, but I believe in Jesus. And I said, ooh. Right? She wasn't ready, so we exchanged information. I've already been texting with her since I got back. 
You know, pray for DeLake. Pray for DeLake's mom. DeLake's mom's very sick, so everybody put her on your prayer list. Um, that God would do a miracle in her life and bring healing, whether by actually physical healing or healing by taking her home. Um, but like, like that something amazing would happen in this next few moments. What happens when someone comes to you and they're ready to receive answers? Like you'll know, the Holy Spirit will say, now's your time, speak up. But if you don't recognize the Holy Spirit's voice, you won't know when he's speaking to you. Come on. And if you pick fruit before it's ripe, it's often very bitter. So don't be in such a hurry to close the deal. I did not lead the lake to Jesus on that trip. And people are like, what, are you going to wait till you go back a year and a half from now? Because I'd like to go back. No, no, no. I mean, we'll figure it out. Or somebody else will lead her to Jesus. I'm just going to plant seeds. And then let God do what God does, right? You don't have to correct everyone when they are wrong. Just because you have the right answer doesn't mean that you have to give it. If the timing isn't right and the soil isn't ready and the conversation is going to make you turn the good news of Jesus Christ into bad news, you'd be better off to shut up. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is, oh, you can say it. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is, yeah, right? Teenagers, listen to me. Sometimes the best thing that you can do when you're fighting with your parents, shut up, right? It's just a short amount of time, and you're going to be 18, 19, and then you're going to get to leave and do it your way anyway. So you can just shut up for two more years. (laughs) I've done it. You can do it. I believe in you. I'm praying for you, right? Number, like here, Judges chapter 8 says it like this, Um, Gideon was at war with the Ephraimites, and in this particular passage, he really honestly, in a battle with him, he gives them a good spanking, like he kicks their butt, takes names, he's, it's pretty rough, and so after it's all settled, and they're like sort of deciding what's this new dynamic going to be like now that we're under your control, he says, how come you like embarrassed us so badly, and they come at him a little bit, and he takes the time Even though they were criticizing him sharply, he takes the time to explain, hey, man, we were at war, and this is what it looks like, and it wasn't personal, but now it doesn't mean we can't coexist. Now it doesn't mean we can't figure out a way for it to work out. And so sometimes you have to wait till the battle's over. Listen to me, husbands and wives. Listen to me. Sometimes in the heat of the argument is not the time to win the the war. Just You might have to lose this one. So that you can have a conversation later that makes more sense when the heat has died down, right? And, and sometimes people aren't going to hear it in the middle of it. If you have a coworker and they have to stay late and they're all amped out about it and you're all, they're like mad. And, and they're like, I, I had plans. I didn't want to be here. They're getting overtime and they're mad, right? But you can't tell them, well, you're going to get overtime. Isn't that cool? They're like, No. But then when they get their paycheck and they're like, dang, look at my paycheck, that's because you stayed late the other night. Do you remember that? Sometimes you have to let the heat of the fight and the heat of the complaint die down before you can bring clarity to the moment. So you don't feel like you have to solve it. You're not in a hurry. Nobody's holding your feet to the fire. Number three, if you're taking notes, when the person is being overly critical, sometimes you have to ignore or dismiss the complaint. Now, here's what I mean by that. I don't mean shut them down. God's entrusted this person to you, and I believe in you enough that you can let that person vent. I believe in you. You're strong enough, right? You can let that person vent. The other day I was at the grocery store, it was probably about a month ago, and you know the pleasantries that you exchange at the grocery store? Like I'm in line, and it's my turn. I put all my food up on the belts, right? Right? And it was like an old school grocery store where they bag your groceries for you. I, those still exist. Yeah? Um, and so I put all my foot up on the belt and it's going through, beep, beep. And I get to where it's my turn and I say, how are you today? And the cashier begins to just verbally vomit about how terrible their life is and how messed up it is and everything's falling apart. And there's a line of people behind me. And I'm like, is this like a Holy Spirit moment where I'm supposed to like tell this person it's going to be okay, and I'm like, literally, while they're telling me, I'm just like, Lord, help me. I just came for some tortillas and some cheese so we could have quesadillas, 
right? Like, am I supposed to minister to this person? The line's starting to back up. What am I supposed to do in this moment? And I discerned in the moment that I was just supposed to let that person say what they had to say. And I was supposed to say, I'm sorry that you had a rough day. I'll be praying for you. And that was it. I didn't offer solution. I didn't offer advice. I didn't try to fix the problem. It was just letting that person be heard. And even though, right? And so then when I left the place, I did immediately. I got in my car. I prayed for them. And you know what I did? I dismissed it. I don't have the ability right now to carry that person's problems with me home. I got enough going on for me right now. I'm strong enough to let them vent and I'm strong enough to hear it, but it really had nothing to do with me and there was really nothing I could do in this moment except for just listen for a second and then I'm going to dismiss it. It's not my weight, not my water, doesn't belong in my backpack. Are you with me? Sometimes you just have to learn how to do that. And it's hard. It's, it takes some practice because I took all this time and we invested this time for you to tell me all your problems and I'm really good at fixing stuff. Let me fix it. No, sometimes you just have to dismiss it. Sometimes people are going to come at you hard and fast and they're just being overcritical and they're really not even talking to you. They're talking to themselves or someone adjacent to you and they just know that you're strong enough to take it. In your work group and in your office, sometimes your boss yells at you because you won't cry, but they yell at you so everybody else in the office sees it. And so you know what you have to do? Dismiss it. And after things calm down, maybe you can go back to your boss. Hey, if you need to make an example out of me so everybody else understands it, could you tell me in an email first? (laughs) Right? But you don't have to carry it. It's not for you to carry. Sometimes people say things to you that are super left field. And after they're done with their rants, right, what what we traditionally want to say is, are you done now? (laughs) And then we're going to unload back on them with equal fire, right? not worth it. Dismiss it. Maybe they had a bad day. You don't know what's happening in their life. You don't know why they're freaking out on you, right? I find it amazing. This lady one time, this wasn't that long ago, I accidentally, I accidentally cut her off. Now, I say accidentally because I taught you guys how to cut people off, right? Remember how I taught you how to do that on the freeway? This was truly an accident. I cut her off. She followed me off the freeway, followed me into a parking lot, got out of her car, and then knocked on my window. And I looked at her, and I was like, Right? And I was surprised because you know me and love me and you think I'm sweet. I don't look that sweet. So she's like, boom, boom, boom. You cut me off on the freeway. Rah, rah, rah. You could have killed me. Rah. I'm sorry. That's all you have to say? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yes. Right? Well, F you, blah, blah, blah. She keeps going, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She had no right to talk to me the way she talked to me. Honestly, not very many people get to talk to me like that. (laughs) But in the moment, like she was just being overcritical and it wasn't worth my energy, my time, the use of my emotions to get anything more invested in that conversation. And so sometimes you just have to know, I'm just going to dismiss this. Sometimes the people are unhealthy or wounded emotionally, right? In my years on this corner, I have worked alongside of a lot, a lot, a lot of unsheltered people. And I'm going to tell you something. If you weren't mentally unstable or mentally ill when you got on the street, being on the street for any length of time will take a toll on you and you can become very mentally unstable and mentally ill very quickly. And so a lot of my friends who are unsheltered they're, they're wounded and broken emotionally, physically, psychologically. Not all of them, that's not fair to say, but a lot of them, right? And I, the only thing I have look, to look forward to is that I get to walk alongside of them and someday I'm going to get to heaven and they're going to be bright-eyed and clear and lucid and we're going to have conversations and it's not going to be, like the conversation will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Most of the conversations just have a beginning and then they like trail off into whateverness, Right? And I know it's not a politically correct statement, but have you ever tried to reason with a crazy person? It never works. You ever tried to reason with someone who's outrageously angry? It never works. Have you ever tried to reason with someone who so meaningfully hurts by a political party or by something that happened into their past and all they can do is say, but, 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 and and you can even be agreeing with them and they're still at war with you. Sometimes you just got to dismiss those people because they're not, 
They're just not all there. They're not capable of really having an interaction, a conversation. And so you can't let their critique go, to, go deep inside of you. Sometimes they, they, would, they can't deal with their own stuff, right? We used to call it kicking the dog, right? You, you can't deal with it, so what do you do? You take something that is smaller than you, that can't do anything to you, and you take it out on them. Sometimes your boss is just kicking the dog, and unfortunately in this scenario, in this metaphor, you're the dog in that moment. And sometimes you just have to dismiss it because they're getting a divorce, because they just filed for bankruptcy, because their boss just came in and kicked them, and they were the dog. And live in that moment, it doesn't do any good. Now, again, I'm not talking about not having boundaries. I'm not talking about constantly taking abuse. I'm just talking about if you're going to keep the good news the good news, you're going to have to learn to discern. Do you hear me? If you're going to keep the good news the good news, you're going to have to learn to discern. You can't just do the same things you've always been doing when it comes to your interactions with people and expect them to work out the same way that they've always had. Because what you've been doing isn't working, is it? So it's time for a change. It's time for something new. It's time for something different. So we're inviting God in, right? Jesus is talking with his disciples, and some of the Pharisees are mad, and Jesus has, has been told this by his disciples. Hey, some people are mad because of the things that you're saying. And he says, not every plant was planted by, was planted by God. Not every idea is God-centered. Some of them have to be uprooted. Some of the weeds have to be pulled. And so sometimes it's best to just ignore them and let God pull the weeds. This is what's happening in this, in this verse, right? He says they're like the blind leading the blind, and they're going to both fall into a ditch. Like, it's a really great statement that Jesus is making. You ready to hear what he's saying here? He's saying, not my pig, not my farm, not my monkey, not my circus. <laughs> he's saying, I, yeah, I can't deal with this because it's not mine to deal with. They're going to while out, and they're going to while out, and I'm going to let God handle that in his timing, but I'm not going to carry it with me. I'm going to let it roll off of me. Now, it takes practice. It takes time. But sometimes what we want to do is combat the people that do that. They come out of us with complaint, and instead of dismissing it, we want to fight it. Notice that there wasn't an example today that said when someone complains, you should punch them. Right? It's not a biblical context, right? We talked about it. Listen, right? Ignore, dismiss. Right? Like sometimes, sometimes that's what it takes. And, and there's opportunity for you to feedback. There's opportunity for you to share. But you have to discern what that looks like. You have to pay attention. And it's really helpful if you're prayed up. It's really helpful before you go into, you know, a, a, a conversation with your spouse that you know is going to be heated that you ask God to be in the center of it. Or pause and go, hey, let's just pray together right now that God would be in the middle of this conversation and that our agendas wouldn't be as important as his. You should pray before you go into a, a staff meeting, a board meeting. You should pray before you confront your kids with some of their behavior. You should pray when it's report card time and your kids are gonna come home that God would give you the words to speak affirmation into their life and celebrate the wins and critique the losses and invite him into the middle of it so he can change the world with you. Like, you can't make everybody happy. There's always going to be people that are mad at you. There's always going to be people that complain about you. There's always going to be people throw shade towards you, right? But the good thing is, is you don't have to make people happy. You just have to make God happy. And so I want to pray this prayer sort of over you, pray this scripture over you. Stand with me where you're at. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. In the chaos of our lives right now with what's going on with our church, with everything that's going on in your family, with everything that's going on in our world, and then you take on top of that, like the chaos of the coronavirus, right? Everybody's freaking out. I just stop drinking Corona. You'll be okay. There's better beers for you to drink, guys. You know, like with all of that going on, in, in all seriousness though, right? I, I want you to understand something. It's messy, because people are messy. But it's those same messy people that Jesus died for. You and your mess, he looked down through time and space and said, they're worth it. Look at that mess. I can bless that mess. I can redeem that person. I can turn it into something powerful and amazing. And he wants to do that. Notice what he says 
1 Thessalonians, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, he says, for we speak as messengers who have been approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. Again, this is one of those verses that we take out of context. Oftentimes, we just sort of focus on the blue parts of the verse. Well, it's my job. I'm approved by God to be his messenger, and I don't have to make you happy. I just have to make God happy, so I can just say it like it is. But notice in the middle what it says, the good news. If you don't learn how to deal with praise and complaints, critique and criticism, manipulation, if you don't learn how to deal with it, if you don't learn how to discern the difference, if you don't learn how to be good at it when it comes to the people God's entrusted to you, you will turn the good news of Jesus into bad news. And my challenge for you as we move into this next season of our life, where for all intents and purposes, we're sort of doing like a reboot of who we are. We're moving into a new neighborhood where we're going to spread the good news of Jesus into that community. And we're going to help them see who God is and what his plans and purposes are for them. And they've been without that presence right there in their close-knit neighborhood for quite some time now, as Aaron said. And we get to go there. And we're going to be met with some opposition. Do you know why? Because Satan isn't happy that we're on mission. His plan was to take all of this out. And God said, ah, we'll just move job sites. We're good. His plan was to discourage us and distract us. And God goes, no, no, no. I'll just put you somewhere else that needs you just as much. His plan was to make it difficult for us. And I'll tell you something. Satan's been on the move to try to take out me and my family for sure. I'll tell you what. But I know that God has something in store for us. I know that God has something for us that's bigger than what we've ever had for ourselves. And I know that our goal is to make the good news possible. We just say it like this, bring hope to the world one person at a time. And so we're going to walk in that truth. And we're going to speak that truth. And we're going to make the good news front and center of all we do. Let's worship him as we sing this song one last time.